Well, 76 was the famous, everybody sort of remembers it, uh, the great drought. Uh, all the grass everywhere in the garden went totally brown. Uh, the glasshouse people, the prop people were forever damping down and shading and wearing. Temperatures were off the scale. Uh, trees were sh- shriveling. Irrigation was everywhere where they could get it. Uh, it was a good year for a, for a suntan, I remember. Uh, but one uh, particular her memory springs to mind. The, the lake in the garden, uh, the water level... Uh, really sort of dropped that year. It was overcrowded by the water lilies and uh, they were asking for volunteers to go in in the waders to uh, pull the rhizomes out uh, to clear the lake of a lot of the uh, uh, quite invasive lilies. And uh, I was one of the volunteers. And I think it took about a month uh, going round uh, one person in the punt, two or three in the water, pulling these. It was a smelly, uh, muddy job, uh, but quite enjoyed it. We had, we had some good uh, good times. And my little party trick, I do remember, uh, early mornings, uh, we used to pull one or two of the roots and bubble some of the marsh gas up. And uh, if you were quick and threw a match down, it used to ignite. Then you used to get a flame going two or three yards. But this particular day, it was quite exceptional. Uh, I don't know really why, but it must have been a quiet night. And we went down as normal. There was me and a couple of the other lads uh, going into the water. And I pulled these roots and got the bubbles and threw the match down. But instead of getting the couple of square yards of woof with the flame, this flame went woof and virtually went right round the lake. It all lit up in a flash of a second. About 150, 200 mallards took off into the air with the surprised looks on their faces as the sort of uh, tail feathers sort of were singed. And uh, it made everybody jump, including me. And, uh, you know, it was just a flash. But that flash is stuck in my mind like 37 years. Uh, I can't remember who students were in the water with me, but I'm sure it's stuck in their minds as well, you know. So that that's sort of one of the uh, the smiley points of that year. The lake, as we found out, was uh, populated by eels as well. And some of these eels uh, was three, four, five foot in length. Uh, probably about three inch in diameter and uh, when you grabbed an eel instead of a, a rhizome and you pulled it and it wrapped around your arm and started looking at you it uh, gave you quite a shock but if you kept hold of it uh, and gave it to Tony Offley who was the uh, rock garden uh, supervisor he used to cook them and he used to love them and uh, he used to be able to go home 15, 20 minutes early if you gave him an eel. We were terrible with you because we took you for walks in your pram, and I remember taking you for a walk down the drive, and the pram sort of tipped up into the hedge. <laughs> And we just ran back. We were so terrified. We left me in the hedge. We left you in the hedge. That was the Tony Astor hedge, which I think is still there. One Christmas, we had a wonderful Christmas, and the the garden produced um, Jack Stevens made us a a, a sledge, a toboggan. And there was never any snow, of course, after that, because if you get given a toboggan, there's never any snow. So we had, but it had wheels on it, so you could. And I sat on the toboggan, and you cycled round. The allotments and pulling you and every time I yes every time I went round a corner I went into a hedge yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't care <laughs> I remember trying to get Poppy the dog to pull me on that sledge once <laughs> she was very willing but not that <laughs> no, she wasn't very willing <laughs> I don't know <laughs> the other thing about that was that with the number of animals that we had because um, Carolyn rode horses and had horses and and actually had a foal here that lived here, mm-hmm. and, and she was breaking it in. And this foal got out and into the garden. And, and I mean, it's unthinkable now, really. And I had a goat for a year, 
which constantly used to escape into the garden. And we'd get a telephone call and say, she was called Cymbalina. And we'd, they'd say, Cymbalina is in the ladies' toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Will you please come and get her? <laughs> Carrying. But you used to actually, I can remember riding, we had another pony called Tippy. No, <laughs> I remember Tippy. riding Tippy down the drive and then jumping over the little box hedge into what was then the original winter garden and actually riding through the winter garden on this pony and mm. out again the other end. And I think we used to regularly do that. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary, really. Coming from Yorkshire, my father was a Yorkshire coal miner. Uh, I was brought up playing the cornet and uh, I took this instrument down as my hobby as well, playing and uh, living in the cottage uh, and keeping my ears open. Uh, it didn't take long for me to, to realise there was a girls' convent school next door which had music lessons upstairs and uh, one in particular little... Uh, tricks was to switch the lights off in the evening and when the music lesson started I used to start playing alongside them but either a sharp to eye or a flat to a low so it was like chalk on a board putting them off and the teachers was really uh, sort of losing the rag a little bit and politely trying to tell me to be quiet but not knowing where to shout because they didn't know where the music was coming from. I were living in the cottage it was just below Peter Horace's uh, superintendent's house and uh, he used to be coming in and listening this kerfuffle going on and uh, Dr Walters going into Corey Lodge. Uh, I didn't realise they were sort of listening and laughing in the background. It didn't take me long to find the Panton Arms and uh, the Green King Abbot went down a treat, uh, more than one. I used to go to the uh, red telephone box just along Trumpington Street there which is still there now uh, where I used to phone my mother and father uh, two or three times a week and on my way back uh, I kept hearing this piano music coming out of this doorway and the door used to be open and I used to whistle a few bars in and then scarper quick and uh, it led to this lady calling me back and a conversation sort of ensued and I started taking my cornet around in the evening and playing duets and this fellow was sat in the corner singing along and we were drinking the sherry and the occasional whiskey and off I'd go to the Panton Arms and back to the cottage and it weren't while the Christmas uh, party which we had in Bateman Street at the time and all the the bosses and the students got together uh, the students were at the far end near the door the staff was in the centre the uh, Dr Walters, Pete Horris, Norman guests were on the top table and uh, this old fella started waving at me and uh, I went and I realised it was the fella I used to play the cornet with and the, his missus playing the piano and uh, I found out it was John Gilmore and I had no idea who it was it was just some fella and his missus who were, uh, you know and uh, we had a good natter and uh, there were one or two people quite surprised how friendly a lowly student was with them uh, and how we got to know each other so quickly and it was that evening that we all went round uh, carol singing and I was playing the cornet and I do remember quite vividly uh, Dr Walters holding the staff with the old traditional lantern uh, in and we were singing at this particular house and people were collecting for some charity uh, which is why we were doing it, and it started to snow. And it was sort of magical. It was, you know, you, you, the street light and the snow coming past and the lantern. It was, uh, you know, it was like something out of a Hollywood film. 